So, the, so this is a, uh, uh, I'm the warm-up act uh, to get you going. To, uh, it's Saturday morning, everybody's tired. And so the, my plan is to really give you a starter course on ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. I'm going to walk you through some of the issues associated with the neurobiology of ADHD. Much of that is not in your handout. A lot of it is, some, is posted on the cadra.ca uh, website, which you can go to. But it's more informal. And, and, and remember, um, I'm, I'm the, the focus of this particular talk is very much about targeting our teachers and helping our teachers understand the nature of the broader implication, which is what do we do about these particular children, adolescents and adults, as it may be. So my plan to get right off the top is to talk about some of the impacts of habits and learning strategies. I, I like to focus on, a, on, a, uh, on an emotional concept called the no word, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, the no word. And, and as I progress, we're going to continue talking about the development of children and how it impacts upon ADHD children. Now, of course, ADHD has been around for a long time. This is nothing new. It's been around, but called different names. So it always seems like it's got a fresh start. In fact, when the DSM-5 comes out, probably in 2012, we're all waiting to find out what the new uh, version of ADHD will be called. Dr. Tanek will probably talk more about that this afternoon. The fact is, is that the story of ADHD is a story of humankind. These are individuals that we've all seen when we've gone to school, but we expected them to be the ones in the side of the school, the periphery, the small niche group, the ones that got kicked out, the ones that were in trouble, the bad boys, the quiet girls, lost in space, who never really amounted to anything we thought until they finished high school or got out of school somehow, and when they found their niche area, they found some success. In many ways, the first question that we always have to identify is, why is school such a handicap? Why is necessarily, why is this environment holding them down? And how can we get them through this environment? And I don't think, and I'm pretty sure about this, it has nothing to do with our teachers per se. Professional teachers, do their best. And part of, part of what I understand really is how can, we, how can we better understand these children so that we can, in fact, maximize their potential. But they've always been there, folks. In fact, there are many myths associated with ADHD that I have to confront right away. People think that ADHD is only a childhood diagnosis. It's not. This is a story that goes back to 1957. I mean, this is a belief that, in fact, ADHD simply disappears somehow as an individual goes through adolescence, they do not. In fact, we know this is a lifespan disorder. One or both the parents have it. In fact, this is multi-generational. If you only have to ask one of the parents, who in the family reminds you of Johnny, mom will go, there. Okay, there's your problem. Okay. In fact, it runs through the family and, and both mom and dad, to some extent, probably have this condition. This is a disorder that applies only to boys. No, it doesn't. This is not just about boys. It's found in girls, but girls tend to have more of the inattentive subtype. The subtype of the shy, quiet, daydreaming kid that may not show themselves until they're later on in school. The four times that we see ADHD emerge Primary grade one, grade four, grade seven, and entry into college. And why grade four? Because the curriculum changes to more adaptation. Why grade seven? Because you have multiple teachers and multiple organizational issues in, that you have to deal with. So it shows itself with impairment over and over again. And what we know is the earlier it shows itself, the more likely this child is going to have a learning problem as well. So it's so very important that we look for learning disabilities in young children because it heralds the fact that these children have multiple impairments. It's only found in Western countries and because television is bad. No, it's found everywhere. This is a worldwide phenomenon. This is not simply found in places with high technology or fast-paced life. It's everywhere. 
In fact, there are many places in the world that have a higher prevalence rate than Canada. Surprise, surprise. There are lots of places out there where the, the nature of ADHD is one of the most impairing and costly factors to a country. It's estimated, for example, in the United States alone, that ADHD costs the U.S. $90 billion, plus or minus a few derivative traders. I'm telling you, it's a big deal. The fact of the matter is, this is a huge issue that impacts upon this country. The fact is, we still are grappling with how big this problem is. It's a behavioral disorder. It is not. It's a medical disorder with behavioral overtones. The, the fact is, is that in any medical disorder, it's not just about the medicine, though. It's about integrating the medicines with the behavioral, psychological, and educational agenda. You know, if somebody had asthma, I wouldn't simply just give you a bronchodilator, though it would help you within 15 seconds. That would be the quick fix, but it doesn't solve the problem. It's no different than ADHD. If I had an asthmatic, if I didn't deal with the cat, clean up the house, deal with the trigger factors, etc., I continue to use the medication symptomatically. I haven't solved anything. Same applies to ADHD. The medications work too good. That's one of my biggest problems. They work too good. All of a sudden, everybody absolves responsibility to want to do things to keep this child moving forward into growth. And so one of the key issues here really is, is that we need to understand that the medical diagnosis implication is a holistic integration model. It all has to be put together. It reflects inadequate school funding. By God, you know, you just want to blame the schools. But you can't. As much as, you know, Mike Harris put us back 15 years, the fact is, is that it is not about school in its entirety. We can't blame schools and teachers on this. It is very much about the fact that the prevalence rates are high. Now, back in 1989, the Ontario Child Health Study was conducted by Dan Offord and Peter Satsmary and show that the, in Ontario, looking at 15,000 children, that the prevalence rates here were 5 to 9% of school-aged children. One in 20 kids have ADHD. That's a lot of kids. So when you say one in 20 kids have ADHD, back in 1989, my first question was, where were they all? I wasn't diagnosing 5 to 9% of school-aged children. They must have been hiding somewhere. Well, that's what happened through the 90s. We started becoming better diagnosticians because the data suggested we were missing 4% of those kids who were impaired. Now, just to put it in context for you, one of the other findings of the Ontario Child Health Study was that 85% of adolescents with depression were never seen. 85% of adolescents. That's a lot. How do you miss that group? And so lots of things came out of that particular study, and that's what made it look like the 1990s, the incidence rate went up. We were just noticing the kids that were already out there. The prevalence rates have not changed. Now, of course, as we sort of started looking more carefully, yeah, there's the occasional kid that got misdiagnosed, and it got blown out of proportion that we're diagnosing everybody. The fact is, we as clinicians, particularly with things like CADRA and CADAC, for example, have made it a lot better in the diagnostic processes and standardizations across this country. Kids are overdiagnosed. Well, as I said, the incidence rates have increased. The medical agenda is being pushed by drug companies, because you hear this all the time. Oh, my gosh, everybody's being prescribed medications. We're just drugging our children. That's the belief, you know. People will look at the, the context of saying that this is a disorder where we're somehow just trying to make kids fit into schools, therefore we've got to medicate them all. That's wrong. It's a total distortion of the actual reality. There are lots of studies out there that show, yes, medications are by far the best intervention strategy. But I want to be clear. No medication is going to fix this problem. Medications are here to facilitate the non-pharmacological agenda. The agenda, real agenda, is the behavioral, psychological, and educational agenda. The power is first in the school, the parents, the educators, the, the community. And doctors are here to help, 
help this particular child with medications make it all happen. But without those other interventions, it doesn't work. I was going to show you this tape of the, uh, of, um, the Sound of Music. I'm sure you may somehow recognize that. Unfortunately, my computer's power is not strong enough to show this particular clip. But you all recognize the song, I'm sure. How do you solve a problem like Maria? You may want to hum it to yourself. <laughs> the fact is, and surprising as it may be, for those of you who want to do this afterwards... Within the words of that song are all the diagnostic criteria of ADHD. How do you figure that? All the diagnostic criteria of ADHD are in this song. But here's the problem, you say. I like Maria. She's a likable character. How could Maria possibly have ADHD? Well, therein lies the issue. Children with ADHD are likable kids. They just irritate people. And many people have called ADHD the annoying disorder. <laughs> the fact is, is that I need you to remember this clip. Because in your mindset, you must always think, I like Maria. She's a likable person who screws up. If you see it from that vantage point, it changes your mindset when you go back into that classroom and say, I, yes, I see you yanking my cord, but you know... You can't help it. I'm not taking this personally, because I know deep down you're a likable person. As long as you see something else, if you see an annoying, cynical, aggressive, you know, going after my jugular kind of kid that makes me not want to come to class every day, makes me feel irritated, and yes, I'm on antidepressants, well, the fact is, you've missed the point. We're talking about Maria, who needs help. That's who is. This is the focal point that I can suggest to you that you must have in your mind's eye. So let's talk a little bit about normal child development, because that's where the starting point is. We need to understand normal children and the evolution of the symptoms and understand how these children are different. But remember, and, and this is critical, what applies as behavioral interventions to ADHD children applies to all children. If you do the things that I talk about today and you apply it to all your children in the classrooms, every kid would be better off. That's really the message here. In fact, ADHD children give us the opportunity, frankly, to be better teachers and better parents. That's really the critical thing. And there's much to learn in terms of helping children with ADHD because in many ways we're doing things to protect their emotional regulation, their developmental delays, their self-directed problems, their interpersonal relationship issues, and particularly their self-esteem. Because that's where the biggest hit is. If children aren't managed properly, particularly ADHD kids, they are such a high rate, risk of having impairment of self-esteem and leading to anxiety, depression, that that's where they've been hiding as adults all these years. That's what we've been calling them. Because we know this is a lifespan disorder. What we see in adulthood with ADHD is these are individuals who have been called anxious and depressed. But if we have asked them as adults, what were you like as a kid, you'd have heard the story of ADHD. That's where they've been hiding. Psychiatrists have been calling ADHDs, anxiety, depression, personality problems, other kinds of irritations. The fact is, these individuals have always been out there. So let's start talking about normal development. Okay, children cry. First thing they do when they come out of the world, they cry. And almost like saying, hey, I was pretty comfortable in there. Why did I have to come out? And you cut the cord and I'm on my own. What's going on with this? Kids cry, what parent do they want? Do they want their mom or do they want their dad? They want their mom, of course, because none of us guys have those feeding accoutrements. We want our mothers. And if I wanted to survive, which parent would I want to control? My mom. And therein lies one of the first issues of parenting differences, because I will often find fathers who will say to me, I don't got a problem with the kid. 
I don't know. Uh, if mom was a better mom, uh, frankly, you know, she's too soft in the kid. And I say to dads, hey, this is not about your scintillating parenting ability. This is about the fact that your buttons are different. Mums have a biological need to respond to a child's cry. Dads do not. The fact is, is that it's easier for men to turn off their buttons. We often engage in power battles with kids because our spouses get involved and we have to intervene. But there's a decided difference between women and men in terms of how we respond to an irritation. Women have to respond. They're biologically programmed to respond. Now, I don't want to sound sexist here, but let me be clear. The same context applies to teachers. Teachers are going to have the same issues based on gender. Because the biological nature of the female and teacher means the kid says, well, if it works on the mom, it's going to work on my teacher. And therefore, it behooves you as a professional to say to yourself, I need to turn off my buttons. Because as much as this child knows this is the way the world runs, I cry, you have to respond to me, I cannot be drawn into a power battle by a little squirt. Not going to happen. And as much as my biological predisposition is to react to this child, I must turn it off. Turn it off. Turn off the biological instinct that you have. And let's be clear, children are very good at identifying where your buttons are. They're really good at yanking your cord. All children yank their cord. And so one of the things that children will do, of course, they will extend the button pushing as they progress to language, and they will use one of these five buttons as an extension of the fact that they have power. One. They'll use the charming routine on you. Gosh, Mom, I just love you. You look so nice today. Did you change your hair? Can I stay up later tonight? This is the suck up, kid. Be wary. He knows he's cute. He's coming after you. And even to another species, babies are cute. Baby puppies, baby, baby um, uh, kittens, baby bear cubs. Even to another species, they're cute. And you know it. Because if they weren't so cute, frankly, I'd have eaten them by now. <clears throat> you do. You know, you know, I'm sure you've seen yourself saying when they were babies, you're so cute, I could eat you. <laughs> you know that. Many times I've been found in my children's room, okay, okay, uh, and my wife has intervened, stop eating the children. The fact of the matter is, they're cute, and they use it against you. Number two, the martyr scenario. Nobody loves me. I hate you. You guys are unfair and unjust. How come everybody else has a Nintendo PlayStation they can play until 3 in the morning, but I don't? What's wrong? Are you poor? This is the martyr scenario. This is make you feel guilty. Give me what I want. Number three, the intimidator. I'm going to run away. I'm going to kill myself. I'm calling children's welfare. You're abusing me. I'm going to live with my grandparents. They're better parents than you. This is the child who makes you feel devalued or impotent in your ability to look after them. In school, it's going to be the kid who walks out of class, the kid who runs away and throws in your face those kinds. I hate you. You're, my teacher last year was better than you. So in other words, this is the kid who provokes you and devalues you. You know, I remember asking my son once, he said, he said to me, you know, Grandpa's number one. Oh, I said, okay, fine, that's cute. I said, where, where am I on the ranking? He goes, 17. I said, what? <laughs> I mean, there's 16 people ahead of me? How is that possible? Well, he says, Grandpa gives me everything that I want. And he gives you a buck to go to the dollar store and get you what you want. Yeah, but he gives me what I want. Oh, that's the trick. I, the fact that I bought you a $250 Xbox means nothing, apparently. That's exactly it. Children want what they want. The fourth, the threat. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to break something of yours. I'm going to irritate you until you break. I'm going to bug you until you crack. 
Number five, the passive resistive kid. Cold shoulder, stalling, forgetfulness, eye rolling, sarcastic, mild swearing. One of my favorites, and because my eldest daughter does this on a regular basis, her favorite line is to me, <clears throat> and you're a doctor? <laughs> uh, and like, you teach parenting? What the hell is that about? Okay. Okay. So the fact is, you know, <clears throat> all kids do this. It's normal. What differentiates ADHD children, kids who have difficulties with button pushing, is they do it all at once. They use all of the normative strategies of button pushing, and they yank your cord to a point where, in fact, they rank your, your uh, heart out of your lungs, they throw it on the floor, stomp on it a couple of times, and then they say afterwards, <clears throat> so what's for dinner? <laughs> They're hard. They're challenging. They're using normative button-pushing strategies, but with intensity. And you need to see that. Because in, and what it means is that you have to have a strong resilience that says, I'm not going to get drawn into these kinds of things. I must resist the need to want to get drawn into a power battle. If you can do that, you will be very successful. In fact, one of the most important interventions as a professional working with children is that you must show emotional self-control. First step, if you can learn emotional self-control and not engage in power battles, you will be a powerful teacher, powerful parent. And part of, part of that agenda really is you need to know what your face looks like. Look at your face. And one of the key messages, look at your eyebrows. Your eyebrows are a giveaway. If, in fact, your eyebrows go to narrowing, the moment you do this, this squint where your eyebrows go down and the furrow goes in the middle of your forehead, you lose. You will lose. This kid's looking at your face and senses the fact that you're not in control. So I want you to walk around with your eyebrows pasted up like this. <laughs> That's why clowns have exaggerated eyebrows. The fact is, if you look calm, you are taking away the kid's power. You're, you're needing necessarily to show the child that, in fact, you're in control. So now we're up to the second step of parenting and teaching management and understanding behavioral implications. The child is now six months of age. They've learned to learn to crawl. As they're learning to crawl, they find out that, in fact, there's another way of communicating with you. They knock over the vase on the coffee table. The first thing they do is not cry. The first thing they do is look at you. They look at you. They give you this face of, they look at you. And in your eyes, they determine what their re reaction should be. Now, why does a child need to look at a human face? This is what distinguishes autistic kids, by the way. Autistic kids, autism spectrum disorder children, do not look at a human face. They're not going to succeed in allowing the authority figures to be in control. So they avoid eye contact. As long as I am not looking at you, I have ultimate omnipotence. I live within myself. The world revolves around me. The moment I acknowledge you, therefore I have to understand that you're bigger than I am. Autistic kids won't do that. So we all as children have a natural need to look at a human face. Because up to this point in the first four months of life, children have a natural need to want to look and seek out their source of survival, which of course is the human breast. Round object with protuberant middle. Round object with protuberant middle. Gosh. You mean the human face looks like a big boob? <laughs> exactly. That's what it is. In fact, the kid's looking around for a breast going, I'm looking for eyes. I'm not sure why it's talking to me, but I, I'm going for that one. The fact is, if you put a baby on your cheek, it will root to your nose. Won't it? It will root to your nose. Babies have a natural instinct to want to seek out a human face. And that begs the second part of human development. It's about reinforcement. If you look at a behavior, good or bad, that behavior gets better, goes up. 
If you don't look at a behavior, good or bad, that behavior goes down. So the fact is, part of the agenda really is, is identifying how we reinforce behaviors. One of the difficulties of irritating children is that they draw negative attention to you. And by default, you're reinforcing the wrong behaviors. They walk into the world, primary grade one, with great innocence. They don't realize it's a problem. But because there's so much emphasis on their negative behavior, it starts making them believe that that's really who they are. And that's a problem. Because if they start seeing themselves in negative ways, they start becoming cynical as early as grade one and grade two. That's a problem. How can a little kid lose their innocence and not like school? You're supposed to love school. And you say you don't love school, but in fact, you love school. You love your teacher. You love going to school. That's what should be happening. So cynicism and negativism sneak in very early because we're reinforcing the wrong behaviors. I'm sure you all know the, ad the statement, catch them being good. Catch them being good. So the fact is, when these children act this way, sometimes it's hard to catch them being good because there's so much negativism that overrides it. But that's still very important. Identify positive behaviors and try to ignore negative ones. So the question becomes, why are these children so irritating that leads them to this down this particular path? Sure, there's a developmental construct that they're pushing buttons, but it's more than that. It, t it speaks to the issue of what's happening as soon as they enter into school, though, frankly, parents will have noticed these symptoms going back into early childhood, as early as, grade, as age two, sometimes even earlier. So what happens then in these particular kids? How do we understand the nature of the button pushing and the nature of their particular difficulties? Well, there are four theories that describe the nature of what's happening for these particular children. Theory number one. Theory number one is called the arousal theory, or the theory related to the fact of how they filter and process information. The arousal theory looks like this. Imagine me having a filtering system that looks like this. If I have a filter that necessarily is wide open, then my ability to process information is going to be a problem. Because when I sit at my desk with a wide open filter, I'm going to look like this at school. I can't focus on anything. I can't focus because I have a wide open filter. So mom will say to me, well, Johnny can watch television for hours. He can play Nintendo. He loves playing Lego. If he enjoys something, he can focus for a long period of time. Why is that? Well, the filtering hypothesis suggests that, in fact, this child's brain, for some reason, falls asleep too fast, shuts off too quickly. It's under-stimulated, under-stimulated. And by default, the only way that I can keep my brain stimulated is I have to open my filter and allow all the junk information in the classroom to come in through my open filter and allow my brain to stay on. Only problem is I can't learn. But if I watch television, which is very stimulating, very stimulating, my filter doesn't need all this junk coming in, my filter goes like this, and I can pay attention. If the world looked like a television set or a computer, in fact, I can focus. So one of our challenges as uh, professional educators is that we have to help children get that level of stimulation within the class. The class has to move faster for these kids sometimes. Despite their learning issues, it's important to chunk information and give it as quickly with lots of variety as possible. Heck, if you're not wearing sneakers, you ain't moving fast enough because these kids need lots of variety. So this, this, the filtering hypothesis would, would suggest that if we can stimulate their brain, then in fact they can focus. That's why medications that are stimulants have such positive ability. Even non-stimulants that are noradrenaline-based, for example, have some of the same qualities of being able to allow my brain to be stimulated. My filter doesn't need information from other sources. My filter goes like this. Boom, I'm able to focus. So the fact is, is that hypothesis number one sounds like it might explain the paradoxical nature of why 
a medication that stimulates people, even to psychosis, seems to normalize individuals with ADHD. And as much as that might be the case, the fact is, it's only a partial understanding. Because we also know that in situations where children have been hurt, physical, sexual abuse, neglect, that they also have filters like this. That's called a hypervigilance syndrome. Those are kids who are like wondering what's going on in my environment because father's coming home alcoholic, he's going to beat up my mom. They're going to have filters like this as well. So the fact is, while the filtering hypothesis is a good idea, it's not specific to ADHD. So you can see some of the same symptoms in different kinds of kids. So theory number two comes on board. Theory number two suggests we have a problem of executive functioning. We have difficulties in the way children process information and the nature of how they make competing decisions. And what we see is that there's a need to want something. I want, I want, I want. And these children have difficulties in their ability to turn off the strength of their want. So they have a problem with the no word. They have difficulties in being able to shut down a primitive, exploratory excitability. Think of it this way. If I took my wallet out and I put it on the desk and I said to a kid, do not touch this wallet. Do not touch it. We're all going to leave the room right now. Do not touch the wallet. Now, of course, every kid is going to go, well, I wasn't going to touch it, but now that you mentioned it, now you said, don't touch it. Now you really aroused my curiosity. Now I'm going to have to touch it. And of course, the issue really is, is that the kid needs to have sufficient stop power to get to their hand something fast enough that says, don't do it. Don't do it. Because if you do it, you're going to get in trouble. Well, children with ADHD have clear difficulties in executive functioning. They have strength of go signals, and they have weaknesses of stop signals. They can't get the no word down to their mouth or their hands fast enough to create sufficient stop power. The fact is, these are children who are impaired. Now, it's more complicated than I've made it to you, but it's roughly in the same direction. Multiple ways of information processing get distorted in a way that prevents this child from providing sufficient judgment regarding the way they attack situations. So they get in trouble. They can't stop themselves. And some, in many ways, sometimes they'll say to, say to you or say to, say to themselves, I, this seems like there's something inside of me that just I can't control. They may even describe it as another voice. They're not psychotic. It's, in fact, an internal dialogue that they're still fighting with. So the fact is, they get into trouble. Now, children who have the inattentive subtype, the shy, quiet ones, they're also impulsive, but internally impulsive. They're daydreaming. They're lost in space because their mind won't stop thinking about stuff in fantasy. So you tell them, stop doing that. Focus on your work. Do your job. So they'll try They'll try to focus, but they'll uh, drift off into fantasy land. The fact is, they can't stop either, but it's internalized. So whether I'm being distracted by external things or I'm being distracted inside my mind, the fact of the matter is, I'm being distracted. So in this distraction, we know that medications also help. We know that medications changes the executive functioning so that there is more internal self-control, and an ability to help the individual focus on task. I can make the no word stronger. I can enhance the circuits. I can give you stop power. So the fact of the matter is we know this works because the medications changes many of the cognitive tests that measure executive functioning. Dr. Tannock will talk about this, I'm sure, at great length in terms of looking at some of the clear literature here. So the area of executive functioning, the area of looking at how the internal judgments are made, are a clear area that is an error in these children. Number three, the third way that we look at children with ADHD is the nature of their brain structuring. 
Uh, we know that the prefrontal cortical area, the right side of the brain, prefrontal cortical area, is one area that we know part of the story will lie. In this particular part of the brain, it probably houses some of the executive functioning issues. And we know on PET studies, positron emission tomography studies, or looking at things like, like uh, fMRI and glucose regulation, blood flow, etc., that this part of the brain doesn't light up easily. We often refer to it as hypofrontality, hypofrontality, as if they're not using a part of the brain. But here's what's interesting. If they turn on this part of the brain, and oftentimes because they're excited or they're faced with a deadline, all of a sudden adrenaline rushes through them, that brain turns on and it turns on with such intensity that they have a strength that comes out of them that other children don't have. It's kind of like, like this Ferrari engine that's sitting there revving, but just not starting. But the moment the light turns on and boom, that brain kicks in, that brain works better and with more creativity and excitement than other people's brains. And therein lies one of the basic constructs that we see that they're so influenced by their environment that, but, but the fact is that in the wrong contexts, their brain doesn't allow itself to show its true potential. So they look like they're in fact incompetent. One of the standard things I often say to my adolescent patients is, you know, if there was a crisis and I needed someone to save my life, I'd pick you. Because in the world of crisis, your brain is the most focused one around. If I needed someone to balance my checkbook, it would not be you. Anyway, <laughs> the bottom line really is, in situations of intensity, their brains are actually high performing. As long as there's sufficient intelligence up there. In other words, if we have children who have been damaged in other ways, like fetal alcohol syndromes or congenital abnormalities, and there's just not enough juice up there to begin with, eh, I can't make the circuits go any better. The fact is, if there's normal intelligence, and now we're trying to find ways of making this part of their brain work better and more efficiently, medications also show their benefit. It changes the nature of the functioning of this part of the brain and other parts of the brain, and all of a sudden, you see better potential. Theory number four, genetic. By gosh, this is genetic. And we know there's a very strong genetic component here. It runs in families. We no longer call it ADHD. We call it ADHD families. We find that, in fact, it runs in families at a penetrance of 80%. In other words, the majority, a vast majority of the way this child is built is based upon their genetic profile. Now, if you look at things like height, for example, which is very genetic, which scores the very end of predictability, just look at your parents. If your parents are short, forget basketball. Okay, You can just look at your parents and determine their na the nature of your height. But many disorders have very strong genetic propensities. Asthma, on a scale of 0 to 1, where 1 is highly heritable, asthma comes in at 0.4. Breast cancer, like 0.6. Schizophrenia, like 0.7. ADHD comes in at 0.8. 0.8, and this is the worldwide prevalence data. At 0.8, 80% of the way this kid is built is because of the genetic profile of this kid. And we have found genes. The first gene was discovered at CAMH in 1998. It was called DRD4.7. This particular gene, of course, is a dopamine gene. Well, because most of the medications we use are dopamine-based, that's where you'd probably want to look for it. So dopamine genes, we know, underride and regulate ADHD. But there have been many genes discovered since that time. And those genes are the area that we're looking for because this is a highly heritable transgenerational disorder. It runs in families, and it will continue to persist if we don't start learning how to intervene at an earlier age. So lots of theories out there that describe the nature of ADHD, but I can tell you for sure, this is real. There's no difference in any other medical disorder, like a child who's blind, or a child without a limb, or cystic fibrosis, or anything else. 
this is real. And not to identify this child in a way that says, they're built this way, it is not their fault, is in fact a disservice to this child. And to victimize them further. Be clear. So here we have a child who is built this way, enters into school and finds ways, yes, of pushing your buttons, yes, of drawing negative attention to themselves, and now you've learned that you need to reinforce their behavior the right way and turn off your buttons. But now the child is 18 months of age. At the time of the child is 18 months of age, they're starting to develop the no word. This is the word of autonomy, remember. No, I want to feed myself. No, I want to do things my way. No, I want to open the door. They can't even do half this stuff. It doesn't matter. My ability to say no to you is my ability to establish my independence. The no word is the word of power. Here's the problem. This is the boy, girl, who has a problem learning how to use the no word on themselves. They have difficulties of emotional self-regulation. They have difficulties in stopping themselves. They have difficulties in their interpretation of the no word. See, if you use the no word against me, you're ostensibly saying to me, you don't love me. I want, I want. I want this, I want that. If you say, I can't do it, or I can't have it, that means you don't love me. If you don't love me, then I hate you. I will defend myself against anyone who tries to reject me. In fact, if you look at one of the trigger factors of these children's aggressive symptomatology or withdrawal, it's often because someone says no or they are forced into a transition that they can't handle. You forced me to do something, then necessarily I have to resist it. So we see that during this period of time, 18 months to two and a half years, children are learning the ability to have internal self-control. You know, you would have heard this as the anal phase of development. That's what happens at 18 months, two and a half years. You're learning toilet training because it's about emotional self-control and trust. You think of it from the kid's point of view. Here I am getting my nails clipped or getting my hair cut. So who told me that hair or nails was dispensable? Can you imagine the terror in a kid as he's cutting his hair and he's wondering, are you going to cut my ears off too? Oh my God, how far are you going to go? I really don't know. I didn't know the hair was dispensable. I think of them during toilet training. Now up to the point, up to that point, they had their diapers on so they couldn't really tell. But now they've removed their diapers and they're sitting on the potty and you're standing over there with an baited anticipation. And they're sitting there in absolute terror, having the stool. All they're thinking is, my guts are coming out. My guts are coming out. Okay, all my guts are coming out. Oh, my God. My guts came out. And you're starting to go, oh, my God, he's having a party. He's having a party. And you go, what the hell's wrong with you, for God's sake? I'm dying here. And the fact is, you're happy that my guts have come out. Well, I'm going to have to trust you on this, aren't I? I'm going to have to trust you that this is okay. In fact, the mechanism of trust, interpersonal relationship, and self-regulation are all tied together. Children have to trust authority figures that things are going to be okay, and they have to learn to let it go. Anxious children don't do this. Anxious children hold on. They can't let it go. They hold on. You often see that in their toilet training. They can't, they get constipated. They can't let it go. They become anal retentive. The fact is that they, they overthink. Externalizing children just want to dump and run. They don't care. Sometimes, in fact, they suppress the signals because they're having too much fun. And the next thing you know, they get impacted because the stool has been built up and next, then they start having difficulties of bedwetting or, or problems with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with their urination because, remember, the stool sits on top of the bladder. Or they have difficulties with their bowels themselves. So the fact is, is that there's a component of the way we see toilet training as part of this emotional self-regulation. And you, wouldn't, you would find it very common, in fact, for parents to say, you know, it's like the terrible twos never stopped. It's as if this child continues to feel as if 
we're still in a power battle. That the no word becomes the embodiment of that power battle. They're not relinquishing power to me. When I say no, they're interpreting it as rejection. Not as what it should be that I'm telling you that something that you're doing is dangerous and that necessarily you should do something else. You should trust me. But this is tough on these little kids because trust and emotional self-regulation and self-destiny, self-direction is what they're looking for and they're not easily able to relinquish power over to the parent. As, as if it's going like this. As if the kid said to the parent, so who died and left you in charge? So who died, who died and left you in charge? What makes you think you have more control than I do? In fact, a child who pushes the buttons of parents and is able to draw them into power battles does not sense the parent's security and at the same time wants this power because they can't relinquish it to the parents is a kid who now has oppositional defiant disorder. That's what ODD is. ODD is a behavioral construct that speaks to the nature of a child who wants to be in control. ODD. Now there's another reason oppositional defiance occurs. It's because children have insecurity. So if I look at the parents and I go, what's going on up there? What's going on? How come my parents are fighting? One of them died, one of them left, one of them is ill. If I sense insecurity within my parents or my world, that also causes me to do this. In fact, insecurity is one of the most common constructs that drive ODD behavior. So when you look at oppositional defiance within the classroom, you simply, you, you, you should not simply assume, for sure, that this is being driven by the ADHD. You need to always look at the child's environment to see if, in fact, there's anything else that might be factored here that might be driving insecurity within the kid. For example, the kid is being bullied in school that you didn't know about, doesn't like coming to school, doesn't trust his teachers for protecting him, and therefore believes that he has to act with oppositional defiance as a way of being able to ward himself off survive against what he sees as an external threat. Or maybe there's stuff going on at home and he's dumping it in school because this is the only place he feels safe. He dumps it on his teacher. That's what happens. We dump it, our emotions on the people we feel safest with. Maybe that's what's happening. So in many ways, the needing to understand the no word is important to understand what happens in early childhood. That if the child does not relinquish power, this ability of, of wanting power and survival instinct, in fact, is what happens. And that sim seems to, though it's not clear, it seems to lead to what we see as immaturity within these children. That for some reason they want to act like 30-year-olds, but when they don't get their way, they turn into the 2-year-olds that they still are. But Johnny does not act his age. He does not act like the kid he's supposed to be. And by default, he doesn't make friends easily. If he's seven years old, he's hanging around with the four-year-olds or the five-year-olds. Or he's bantering around with the teachers. But he's not acting like a seven-year-old, and he's not, certainly not being invited to birthday parties because he's irritating everybody. He's silly and irresponsible. He's immature acting like the class clown, because he's trying so desperately to draw attention to himself, and the only way he knows how is to be a goof. And that's not the way you do it. So the fact is, is that immaturity continues to persist right through into adolescence, right through to adulthood, to the point that by the time they're 40 years old, now we call it youthful vitality. Now it's a good thing. And if they wait till they're 40, life is good. But in early childhood, it's painful because no one takes them seriously. Now, it makes it worse if they're a big kid and immature because people perceive them as having, you know, being older or looking older, but they're not. They act still with a level of immaturity that's a problem. So we see something being stuck here. I can't tell you why. I don't know why this happens. I know we've speculated on lots of different things. 
This is a broad area of research looking for temperamental qualities that might be interfering here. Is it because they're difficult children, or is this at this developmental phase something is something is supposed to happen? I mean, one of the things that we think about that I'm theorizing is: is this child unable to feel the safety of their parents? This is what's called object relations theory. What you're supposed to do at the age of two years old is you're supposed to be able to turn the corner, and even though you say you can't see your parents, you still know they're there. You feel their safety because they, you hold on to them. Sometimes you use a transitional object like a teddy bear or a blanket to feel their safety. But is it that these children still do not feel the sense of safety? They have not internalized the narrative of their parents. They can't hear the dialogue that says, don't do it. Trust me, don't go there. I mean, parents do this all day. They, before the kid leaves the school, the parents say to the kid, okay, remember what we said. Don't uh, keep your mouth shut, listen to the teacher, hands yourself. Every day, the kid screws it up. Like, what happened from the time you left the door to the time you got in the classroom? Did you forget everything that we say every single day? Why can't you hold on to it? Very common statement. Sometimes, you know, as teachers, educators, physicians, we sometimes think the parents aren't doing a good job educating the kid. I hate to tell you, it's just the opposite. They are trying their best. Trying their best to tell this kid and get this kid to hold on to my message. Unfortunately, sometimes it gets to the point where parents get so frustrated that they start feeling overwhelmed to a point that they're not able to influence this kid adequately. But you know, sometimes the teachers have a better opportunity to do that because they're not part of the family, per se. But you are. Teachers are the second family. They, they may actually have an easier time to hold on to you than they may have to hold on to their parents. So the fact is, if the parents aren't giving them this internal dialogue, then the teachers may be able to influence this child and make them feel this internal feeling that says, look, I like you. Listen to me. When you are faced with this situation, do what you can to stop. And therein lies one of the most important things I can, I can pass on to you today, which is the role of a professional teacher is in many ways a role to continue the developmental progression for this child because they're stuck somewhere. We've already gone over the button pushing, just to rehearse for you the charmer, the guilt, the dominator, the provoker, the passive resistor. You all know that part of the way you're going to influence this child is you're not going to get involved in power battles because the kid's going to look up at you and go, gosh, I like you. I trust you. What you say to me is important because you can handle it. You can handle it. If a teacher or parent can handle it, then in fact you're by default creating the generational boundary that says, hey, I'm twice your size, I'm four times your age, I'm not getting involved in a power battle with a six-year-old. Not going to happen. So we've talked about oppositional defined disorder as pushing buttons, the need for clarifying rules, the need to want to confront authority because they're really driven by insecurity. This is standard oppositional defiant behavior. My boss told me to change the stupid sign. So I did. Okay, you know, this has got ODD, ADHD written all over this one. So we've to, we, I was going to go over some normal child development, actually, but, you know, what I think I'm going to do a little bit is progress the story a little bit right now about the, the next part of developmental communication. And this, this component is learning about how to communicate using command sequences. And one of the clear messages is around the no word. And I want you to memorize this verbatim. What is it that I want you to do, not what irritates me? What is it that I want you to do, not what irritates me? This is a critical message of the way we communicate to children. Now, if I have a spoon in my hand, just imagine for me a spoon in my hand, and I'm at your dinner table. For those of you who know this little trick, just hold on for a second. I'm at your dinner table.
What do you want me to do? Stop, of course. You're human. Your natural instinct was to say stop, don't, or no. And of course, every individual, there's definitely ADHD kids, will respond to this by... So what do you want me to do? Huh? Eat my food. Okay. Be specific. What do you want me to do? Use my spoon to eat. Of course. Use my spoon to eat. But that's not your natural instinct, isn't it? I asked you, what do you want me to do? Your natural instinct was to deal with the irritation rather than the real behavior. So your natural instinct as a human was to say, stop, don't, and no. Well, we've already rehearsed the fact that this kid has a problem with the no word. And so what do you think this kid hears every day? Stop that. Don't do that. No. The one word he doesn't understand, he hears all day. So by default, you're forcing this child to push the buttons. Now, most children, when you say, stop doing this, they get it. They go, okay, I'll eat my food. ADHD kids get stuck on the nature of the concreteness of the rule. So if you say, don't do this, the kid was ready to eat, but they went, okay, well, what's going on? Don't do this. Well, is this okay? I don't know. Is this okay then? I don't know. Uh, I got to figure this rule out that you made up and screwed up my brain. I got to figure, is this okay? I don't know. Is this okay? Is it okay if I scratch my ear with this? I don't know. Is there another thing I got to stop worrying about? Why? In other words, if you screw up the communication, you force me to push buttons. And the key message here is if you're using negative-based commentary. Now, it has a broader implication than simply the mistake of the communication. It has very much to do with the aggravation of this child's anxiety and this child's sense of cynicism. There's a very interesting experiment that was done a while ago, quite a long time ago, by Seligman. It was called Learned Helplessness. It was an experiment where they took a dog, put the dog in a room with a glass wall, dividing the room into two halves, a metal floor. And this dog, in this side of the room, got shocked on their feet. The dog couldn't run away, running around trying to avoid the shocks, eventually sat in the middle of the room and took it. Small mm, eh, eh, mm, eh, eh, shocks. The glass wall comes down, the dog could easily walk over to the other side and escape, but doesn't. You take the will away. And that's exactly what ADHD kids look like. And we know that these are, this is a, this is a, This is an experiment that explains that if you are critical, emotional, and negativistic with children in general, that you drive learned helplessness and push them towards anxiety and depression. They're literally shell-shocked. It's like, you know, constant feeling a barrage of this terror that you're walking through every day. And as much as Parents often feel as if the other way around, that this kid is making me walk on eggshells and making my life as if I'm being held hostage in my own classroom or my own house. These are the children who actually see themselves as being the victims. Because the torture is the constant negativism that they can't escape from. So if you, eh, eh, don't do that, eh, eh, no, eh, eh, stop on a regular basis, you're inflicting onto this particular child the belief that they can't escape just like this lion, just like this, excuse me, like this uh, dog. And eventually, you take their will away. They take their motivation away. And you create within them a resistance that says, I'm not going to do it because I'm going to fail. You're going to yell at me again. You're going to know that I'm not good enough. So they stop working. An environment of nurturing and positivity is an environment that allows the child to feel safe. So safety becomes a critical concern in any environment, and part of that means you need to start looking at the basis of the command sequences. So that's why the words, what is it that I want you to do, not what irritates me, become so critical. So let me give you another example. 
Johnny is touching your stereo. I don't want to hear stop, don't or no, or leave it alone, or any variation thereof. What do you want the kid to do? Eh? Keep your hands to yourself. Okay, I can do that. Um, use, your use your iPod. Kids got an iPod? Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so yes, you could say you're obviously bored. You want to do something. Why don't you use something else? So go, go to your room and play with your toys or your musical instruments or an iPod. Sure, reasonable. What else? Why don't you sit down here next to me and I'll show you how to use the stereo properly. So I'll educate you. That's what I want you to do. In other words, by giving the positive statement, I'm in fact directing this particular child to a behavior that makes me feel good and one that the child can now do that I can reinforce with what? My eyes. That I can reinforce and say to them, thank you for listening to me. Good job. Well done. I'm glad you're figuring out that there's something that you can do to entertain yourself. You're, you're creating the positive redirection. Another example, Johnny is hitting his sister. He's irritated by his sister. What do you want him to do? Go into the other room. Huh? Go, into the other room. Go to the other room. Walk away from your sister. You're ob she's obviously bugging you. You're irritated. To walk away. Get away from her. Absolutely. What else? What else do you want? Huh? Huh? Ask your sister gently. Ask your sister gently. Adverbs, though that L-Y, you know, gently, sometimes are not clear to children. You know, sometimes, you know, we do it by physical demonstration. Let me show you gentle, and you can show them gentle and say, okay, you know, that's the way I want you to behave, of course. But he's angry at his sister right now, so he may not want to be gentle at the moment, so he wants to problem solve his own emotionality. So it could very well be, come talk to me. If you're angry with your sister and you can't problem solve this, seek me out and I'll help you figure out how to deal with your emotions properly, for example. Same thing would apply in the schoolyard. If the child is being bugged by somebody else, don't we say to children, well, go talk to the school, school um, you know, classroom monitor, for example. So the bottom line really is, is that we want children to be able to understand that there are many things that they have options towards, not simply to use their primitive instincts and in wanting to necessarily act out in a negative way. So redirecting children becomes very important. Now, if this was a classroom, it might look like this. Johnny's talking to Ben. The teacher, being human, says, stop talking. So Johnny goes, okay, I'll stop talking to Ben. <clears throat> I'll talk to Sue. <laughs> and so the teacher says, well, you're still talking. Johnny goes and defends himself. Everybody else is talking. Why are you picking on me for? I'm not the only person that's uh, talking here. I wasn't talking. He starts to escalate. The teacher senses his escalation. He says, okay, take a chill out. Go outside. Relax. Take it easy. Oh, I'm the one that's got to go out of the classroom. room. Oh, yeah, okay. He slams the door on his way out. The teacher gets upset. The teacher says, go down to the principal's office and cool off. Walks down to the principal's office. The principal says, so, what's it today? Johnny goes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happened. As far as I can tell, my teacher is psychotic. <laughs> That's as far as I can tell. And so this becomes a never-ending problem. But from the kid's point of view, the teacher used a stop command. Don't do it. I stop talking to Ben. I'm talking to Sue. Technically, the kid is right. Technically, the kid is right. But you might say, doesn't the kid get it? And that's precisely my point. If you're using stop, don't, and no commands, though they may be appropriate for most children, the fact is, is that really using a positive reframe on all children would help direct them in a positive way with less confusion, but for an ADHD kid, you must do it this way. You have no choice. Because they don't understand the natural, nat the natural mechanism of command sequences that makes them feel as if they truly understand what you're, what you're asking of them.
And lastly, when you create the mechanism of, of interaction through command sequences, I often want you to consider the possibility of the yes but no negotiate mechanism. Yes, the contingency strategy. You want something, I want to give it to you. So you do your homework, you go play uh, your toys. If you uh, clean your room, you go outside and play. If you eat your food, you get to your dessert. This is contingency strategy. ADHD children want their fun right away rather than having to do work for it. So unfortunately, they're, they're sidelined by a belief that necessarily I want, I want, I want it right away. They need frustration tolerance and they need to learn to wait. And you're going to help them by creating a mechanism where, they're, where you're connecting positive behaviors, because now you know about positive command sequences, in ways that says, if you do this, you get this. Now, the difficulty with ADHD children is they're often sidelined by the need for excitement and exploratory novelty-seeking. So fixed reward systems may not necessarily be the best way. Fixed reward systems. A fixed reward seems obvious. You do this, you get this. But it's too boring for an ADHD kid. And while it's reasonable, it may not provide the habit construction you're looking for. So variable reinforcement sometimes can be better. So if you listen to me the first time I ask you to do something, which is what I want you to do, and you get a shot at the mystery box, all of a sudden you arouse within this kid a level of excitement that goes, ooh, I wonder what's in the box. I want to listen to my teacher. You've excited me. You've shot some adrenaline to my brain, and all of a sudden I'm focused. I want to work for you. Of course, in the mystery box there are 4,950 pieces of Good job. Well done. I am proud of you. But better luck next time. And 50 pieces of, you got a lava, you got a popsicle or something or something. But the idea really is to create within this child a sense that when I stick my hand in that box, it could be anything. Heck, it's just like roll up the rim, frankly. Okay? There's no difference. And whether you buy a 649 ticket and you have two days of magical thinking of what it could be for a buck, it's a pretty good fantasy. The fact of the matter is, it's the exact same feeling. It creates within you intense excitement. And therein lies one of the strategies that I want you to take. You need to construct habits for these children. And habit construction overrides their attentional problem because necessarily... What you see is if Johnny can get his hand up without having to speak and wait for his name, then he wouldn't be talking. The bottom line really is, is that's what we're moving towards. How can we get these kids habits that allow them to override their natural instincts for exploration? And you all love habits. Humans love habits. We all have habits. I don't think you remember what you did this morning when you took a shower. You just did it. You didn't remember how you did it. You remember how you put your clothes on. You do it the same way. You don't remember how you do anything if you have a habit. And sometimes, you know, we like to test our habits. I'm sure many of you, when you get into a car, you don't put your seatbelt on, but you know it. And you sit around going, I wonder what the cops are. You know, I'm looking around because, you know, I know my seatbelt's off. And you feel the sense of tension because you're a rebel. And the fact is, is that when you put your seatbelt back on, what do you feel? Ah, I can relax now. That's what a habit should feel like. When a habit happens, not doing it makes you uncomfortable. Doing it makes it automatic. And that's exactly what we want for children. When they sit in class and raise their hand and wait for their name and interrupt their own ability to speak out or into or blurt out answers because we've taught them the right habit. Or we help children in terms of their ability for on-task behavior because they know this is the right thing to do. Or we help children at home because they have homework skill, because they know at a certain time their brain only thinks of homework. That in fact, those habits protect them from themselves. The fact is, is that we're wanting children to be more in self-control but the habits really help them in being able to be more functional. 
So the nature of the developmental cycle is to help children learn successful habits that allows them to have the accommodations within school and at home to make them survive. And you're going to do that because you're going to develop a relationship with this child, one of positivity, one of not getting drawn into power battles, one of recognizing that this child is innocent, is not a child who's going out of their way to find something wrong with you, but simply trying to figure out how the world runs. This child needs to be talked in a specific way, with clarity of communication and positivity of direction that helps this child focus on what's important. But because their attention span is so short, they need reinforcement quickly. Because if you don't reinforce them quickly with what? Your eyes and your attention, they lose the sense of what they're doing and they get lost in distraction. And those skills are made easier by the medications because the child at least now has an ability for some internal stop power. But don't fool yourself. The medications do not create the habits. You create the habits. You create the interface of positivity that hopefully this child internalizes to a point that necessarily as they grow older, they feel the safety of school, the love of learning, and the desire to want to meet their potential and be the people that necessarily they can be. And they are going to be the people who will change this world. The nice thing about ADHD ch children is they're not the ones who live in the middle. They're the ones who live at the edge. And because where they live, what they see, no one else sees. People who live at the edge of the world are the ones who change society. The people who live at the edge of the cliff are the ones who necessarily are the ones who change the world to to where growth leads us to a better life. Frankly, as the world gets faster, and we're now inundated with more electronic, high-tech, information technology, maybe the only people that will survive will be the ADD ones. <laughs> maybe these are just children because of their mutational changes that are simply 10 years too early. Maybe that's what the problem is. Maybe the rest of the ones who don't know how to deal with high information processing and crisis mentality, maybe they're the ones who will be impaired. Maybe, in fact, if we allow these children to find their success in the world, that these are the ones who will become normal. Ain't that a kick in the head? The fact is, every child deserves to have their potential realized. And one thing I know for sure is, Professional teachers can do this more than any doc. It's up to you folks. Thank you. Well, you know, the, the question is, you know, is there any evidence regarding a specific developmental superiority of a no, against a normal person uh, versus an ADHD individual? Your point is well taken, but I can speak anecdotally. You know, when I, when I see that my adult patients, and I run the adult clinic at, uh, at CAMH, and I look at the film television industry full of ADHD, you couldn't survive in that industry, frankly. They should just take the Hollywood sign down and put ADD City, frankly. 
Okay? That's where they live. They live in a world of high excitement, of high intensity. If you look at professions that are rescuing professions, military, police officers, paramedics, I'm going to tell you now, I have lots of individuals who are in those professions, and they have superlative records. They thrive in wanting to go to Afghanistan. They love the mentality that in this world that they can make a difference because when the, when the bullets are flying, they are focused. You know, it's very common for a patient to say to me, you know, I need to go down to the 401 at 140 kilometers an hour. 160 would be better. Because when I'm going fast, the whole world slows down and I become super focused. The fact is, sure, all the people behind me are scared as to what's going on, and I might be terrorizing them, but they don't have to worry. Because when I weave in out of traffic, I am so focused that necessarily I am safe. You make me drive 100 kilometers an hour, the speed limit, my brain shuts up. I'm a wreck. I'm dangerous if I have to follow the normative rules. So they'll say to me in the next breath, can you write me a note? Uh, can you write me a note? And when the police officer stops me, I can go 160 kilometers an hour. Your point is exactly right. Individuals who do not learn how to correct and understand the way they're built, if they do not understand or accept what they are, they're destined to find the path to the lower side of the economic ladder and maybe penitentiary. And therein lies one of the critical factors of ADHD. It either moves you to superlative success or abysmal failure. Because the way you're built is different. But difference is not necessarily a bad thing. What I'm suggesting really is, in the right... I mean, Michael Phelps is ADHD. When he's in the pool, I don't think anyone would argue that it works and gives him a decided advantage. You take him out of the pool and stick him into a social context, he's impaired. And the same thing applies to my, the patients that I see. In the right context, they can perform. Sure, they have structure, routine routine, and they may need the kinds of infrastructure that helps protect them. But the fact is, the way they're built is different. And that difference can be good. So, I think your point is, we do need more evidence to show the positive resiliencies here. And to protect these children from the negative influences that restrict them from their potential. That's what it comes down to. And more research is definitely necessary. Well, let me get to your, to your point, which is, yes, I, I did spend a lot of time on the impulse component and, and some portion of the more, more externalizing type of individual. And you're right, you know, this 30, 30 to 40% of individuals who have ADD, the inattentive subtype of ADHD, they're not hyperactive or impulsive, the fantasy, quiet, daydreaming, disorganized, pack rat kind of kid who's lost in space kind of kid. And those particular children, necessarily, are also disabled. But the same principles apply. They're sensitive to the no word. Saying no to them, frankly, they internalize and they, they, and they get anxious. Instead of getting rejected and aggressive, they get anxious. They withdraw into themselves because you're rejecting them. And all they're, all they're thinking about is, what can I do to avoid the no word? So sometimes they go to perfectionism. That need for perfectionism shuts them down because they can never be perfect. So... In many ways, the same principles apply, but applied in, the, in, the, in, a, in a direction that addresses the fact that they have some of the same issues of self-esteem, so internal self-regulation. Instead of externalizing their anger, they hold it all in and explode. They don't let it go. They have those same, same kinds of constructs. And it's interesting, by the way, when you talk about the fact that in a twin, you got one with this and one with this. That's exactly the picture. It's exactly the way we see this.
Do they ever catch up? Unfortunately not. I mean, but they learn the developmental skills along the way where by adulthood that, ad that adaptation does allow them to function within the adult world. But there will always be a certain level of immaturity, for example. And, but I, as I said to, you know, said to you, that immaturity may reflect itself in positive ways if directed that way. Okay? So, so, so it's important really to get them into, high, into adulthood. The challenge for us is that 30% immaturity makes, them hard, it makes it hard for them in terms of social skills. But once they get to adulthood, they will find their niche area. They're, they'll find an employment environment, for example, where everyone is going to be just like them. And then they'll feel connected. It's, it's getting this kid to a place where the context allows them to function and recreate their self-esteem. That's why it's so important. As you know, as parents, one of the things we always focus on is find out what the kid is good at. Identify their strengths and keep moving their extracurricular activities, their school functioning towards the areas of strength that hopefully by high school, those areas of strength have now materialized into actually a career path. All of a sudden, Johnny, who's interested in computers, though it was in video games in the beginning, but you nurtured that ability, and as they went into high school, there was a lot more technology attached to his curriculum, a lot of after school activity, and boom, 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 this kid goes on feeling connected to this particular area, challenges himself because he sees a future ahead of himself, and then goes off onto college or university because now there's something about him that makes him know he will survive. Build his strengths and move them towards an area that, that establishes that context. What you found is that habit construction takes longer and is harder with ADHD children. And so one of the steps that I'm suggesting to you really is utilizing variable reinforcement as a way of starting the, the habit construction. But don't, don't, don't forget, the majority of what you must do to create habits is positive recognition. Look for positive behaviors and reinforce them. Give them attention for the things that they do well and keep pounding them with goodness. Because if you can do that, you will have survived. Unfortunately, we have to go at this particular point in time. I want to rehearse for you for the fact that, that these children do need lots of positivity. Positive parenting, positive agendas within schools is critical. Connecting parents and schools, teachers, and the external environment is the way to go. Finding ways that necessarily we can all work as a team becomes an important agenda. And I can't emphasize enough that one of the things that facilitates that team process is making sure that you, so that you look at service areas like kadak.ca, for example, that creates for you a place, a community that necessarily allows you to be with other parents. It's an information site that necessarily will be important. And in that particular context, there will be other places that I'm working on, for example, totallyadd.com, which you'll see in the future as a place where you will also have communities where parents can meet and also chat together and feel that there's a connection of information that may be able to help you learn and understand more information, but in a safe and positive way and hopefully laced with humor so that you feel a positivity that necessarily there is a place out there that you feel connected.